I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. It is a great pleasure to welcome my dear colleague, Sebastian Gorka, to Stage 17, to WABC. Seb is with me now because his new book, Why We Fight, reorganizes all of us here in 2018 for the Trump administration and the contest ahead. Defeating America's enemies is not just a short list, but it has a history. So, Seb, I want to take you to September 11th, 2001. You were in Hungary. You were a professor. You were preparing for your class. It was mid-afternoon. You get a phone call from the Ministry of Defense, I believe. Correct. Saying, I guess the meeting's off tomorrow. Right. You say, why? <laughs> right. And you're told to, to look at the television. What did you find? Right. So I was sitting in one of those great cafes in uh, Central Europe preparing for my class. I'd spent five years working in the Hungarian Defense Ministry. Uh, I was now a, a private citizen teaching at uh, graduate school. But I kept my hand in and I'd helped arrange a meeting between the, Hung the new Hungarian conservative administration and the Bush administration national security team. And uh, I wasn't in front of a television. I was with my notes and the melange, and I get this phone call canceling the meeting. And all the my interlocutor would tell me is switch on a television. I didn't have cable at home, so I rushed to an American diplomat friend's house who had cable television, and my wife was already there. And the four of us, the couple, my wife and I, sat, stood watching the live footage from here from Manhattan, right. um, as the attack was clearly a terrorist attack. And you and, watched the buildings come down. And we watched the buildings come down. And my American wife uh, looks at it, knows it's terrorism, and says, you're probably one of the few people in Hungary, a small country of 10 million people, who could help explain what this is to the Hungarian viewers because we turned on the Hungarian television – and they had the two most famous talking heads, the equivalent of you know, Walter Cron Cronkite and, and, his, and Dan Rather. And all they were doing, this was the coverage, national television, is they had CNN playing on the green screen in the back. And the one anchor who spoke English was literally doing a, a synchronous translation of the CNN coverage. That was national coverage in Central Europe. And so uh, at my wife's encouraging, I called up the TV station, said, I have a little background in these issues I've worked on counterterrorism issues. Uh, could I be of any assistance? I thought this was a crazy idea, very American idea. And the duty editor said, how quickly can you be in the studio? I was in jeans, unshaven. I said, 40 minutes to get clean. He said, if you're here in 20, we're putting you in front of the camera. And that's how I ended up spending the next six hours on live television for the first time in my life trying to interpret for the national audience, what is going on in Manhattan 5,000 miles away? 17 years later, you're still on television. You're still interpreting. This and, radio. And, and radio. And uh, radio for an American audience. And what you saw that day, what you experienced that day, transforms your education. You're born in London. Your mom and dad are refugees from the Soviet creature. They fled after persecution and, in your father's case, torture because he was part of the resistance. That was the, that was the Seb Gorka sitting there at the cafe when the phone call came in. In this new book, you've put together those experiences, your mom and dad, what you learned growing up in the late 20th century in London, your travels to Europe, your education in Hungary, a reborn country after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And you've put that together with what you've learned here in the United States since you came here at the National Defense University. So it's Seb Gorka's two lives put together in one book. Right. And that's why I asked you to start on 9-11. But let's do some fundamentals about the problems that you see right now. Your father's problem was the Soviet creature, the aggression overwhelming Eastern Europe at the end of the Second War. Your father's generation solved it with resistance, fine. However, here today, this isn't the way we're going to solve the threat, the multiple threats you identify in your books. So let's first go to, we're going to talk about your political life, but we're first going to go to how you organize the threats to us now. On 9-11, the threat was from the jihadists, the cutthroats, 
uh, the radical Islam interpreters that at that point we called al-Qaeda. Who are they today, Seb, 17 years later? I like uh, the name that came out of the National Intelligence Council in the second half of the Obama administration. It's the global jihadi movement because in that uh, you address every threat group which has a global ambition and a global capability, be it Sunni or Shia. It can be a Shia group, it can be the Quds Force, or it can be the Al-Qaeda in North Africa, can be the remnants of ISIS. Anybody who isn't parochial in their strategic objective. The Taliban, parochial jihadists, not a direct threat to the national interests of the United States. Uh, During the campaign and since then, there's been much news about the the Islamic State, not as much news about al-Qaeda because it's it's retreated into the woodwork in some countries. So let's address ISIS. We didn't see ISIS in 2001. Where does it come from? So ISIS is a, a remarkable story because it is the only jihadi group of modern time since the dissolution of the original caliphate in 1924, which managed to reestablish a caliphate. There have been hundreds, whether it's Lashka Taiba, whether it's uh, Al-Qaeda, the original uh, MAC, the Arab Services Bureau, hundreds of jihadi organizations that said the only way for a Muslim to live or for a human to live is under the Islamic State. All of them failed to create a lasting Islamic State, except a small branch affiliate of al-Qaeda in Iraq. These, this is the first of three threats that uh, Sebastian Gorka identifies in his new book, Why We Fight. However, I want to combine them both because you take me to a book, management of, uh, uh, a Savagery. publication, Management of Savagery, Savagery by Abu Bakr Naji. And I believe this is a way of talking about al-Qaeda and ISIS at the yes. same time. Who was he and what was his vision? So Abu Bakr al-Naji was perhaps the most important strategic thinker in the whole Islamic jihadi enterprise since Syed Qutb was part of the Muslim Brotherhood. This is an individual, he's now deceased, he was killed in Pakistan. He was a jihadi writer who created, if you will, the FM, the field manual for the modern jihadi movement, the management of savagery, published as an e-book online. The strategists of jihad were idealists. They weren't pragmatists. A lot of the will of Allah will make it so. This man said, no. If you're serious about creating the caliphate, you must do what the infidel does. You must capture territory. You must govern territory. You must uh, institute Sharia law. You must create a quasi-nation state. Even if the nation state, the Westphalian nation state, is a heretical infidel invention, doesn't matter. It is a it is a waypoint on the journey to create the caliphate. And Abu Bakr uh, and and uh, Naji is very dangerous because he gave them the how of the caliphate. Three phases: first, vexation. Yes. Second, spreading the savagery. Third, administering the savagery. I have to say that Abu Bakr, uh, that ISIS followed all three yes, very carefully. Absolutely. So they, they followed this to to the letter, the vexation phase, where they created uh, they they created space between our ally. Arab nations and the populations of the region. They used irregular warfare to make areas ungovernable. Then they went to the spreading of savagery where they created chaos in the region, such chaos in Iraq, in Syria, or or elsewhere that when they rode in to Mosul, they were seen as the saviors when they created the new model, which is the caliphate. At this point, uh, the third phase should be thought of as a giant lily pad, the FOB, the forward operating base for the new caliphate, a, a land mass from whence they can launch new phase one and phase two attacks on new areas, be it Saudi Arabia, be it Jordan. This is exactly what ISIS did. And until the 45th president of the United States arrived, it was working. They were administering it with a big budget. Yes. And that budget was from oil, from piracy, from slave uh, slave slave markets, slave markets. And that is administering savagery. Yes. That's exactly what he designed. They're they're taking it out of his book. Right. It it, it is remarkable that (sighs) there are very few wars, serious threats, in which the designs, the strategic designs of the enemy are completely hidden. 
For Hitler, it was Lebensraum. Right. For the jihadists, it's caliphate. And this was an unclassified document on the Internet, and we didn't pay attention to it. I'm speaking with Sebastian Gorka. Why we fight defeating America's enemies with no apologies. We've addressed how Seb thinks today, all these years later, after he was dragooned into Hungarian television for six hours, about the threat from the jihadists, from the cutthroats. When we come back, we're going to turn to the threat from the state actors. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. Sebastian Gorka, my colleague from many years, is the author of a new book, Why We Fight, Defeating America's Enemies with No Apologies. What is fresh here is that there are two new foes that... Through the Obama administration and the Bush administration and the Clinton administration, it was not clear to those of us who watch national security that the U.S. was going to focus on the threat. We're now focused. Let's start with Russia. Uh, Your experience with Russia from your dad and mom is that no matter how they dress it up, they're aggressive. And they're aggressive, especially along the boundaries of the empire. Is it your opinion that the Trump administration is addressing it adequately now after the failures of the Obama administration to see what Ukraine represented? I think sending Javelin anti-tank missiles to Kiev instead of socks and blankets is is a very uh, serious improvement from the Obama years. So, yes, and uh, the personalities who are making the decisions, not just in the White House but but elsewhere, for example, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, General Dumford, fully – appreciate that uh, a KGB colonel is always a KGB colonel. And the, the important way to look at Russia is not as the Soviet Union of yore, but uh, what I like to call an anti-status quo actor, constantly looking to destabilize. Uh, we, we tend, as Americans, I, I love my fellow Americans, we tend to posit good faith on behalf of the other. Right. I'm okay. You want to be okay. Yeah. I, yes. I say something and I must yeah. mean it. And, and let's, do, let's do business. Let's do business. Yes. The Kremlin has never worked like that, whether it was run by a czar, whether it was run by Stalin or by a KGB colonel. So we now have the requisite knowledge and understanding that these are bad actors, not the Soviet Union. This is a, a, a nation in, uh, in demographic and economic collapse, but a nation that will constantly endeavor to create eddies, world, little whirlwinds and, and whirlpools, which will destabilize certain regions, after which they can do what? Exploit it to their own benefit. And there's, a, there's a eight phases, and yes. we won't go through the details. They're in the book. But right now, I would say all, those eight phases are present in a number of geographies across the edges of the empire, from Syria to uh, the Baltic states, right. including Ukraine. So the eight phases of Russian doctrine today – uh, I, I, I credit the Latvian Ministry of Defense, the yes. Defense uh, uh, Institute, that wrote an excellent English one study. One of the targets. Well, one of the primary targets right. of, of the Baltic region. Um, they wrote a wonderful English language study that I pray see in, in, in my work. And it's nothing very new. There's a lot of, in the Beltway, people talk of hybrid warfare, seventh generational gray zone. That's just wrapping on, on old forms of irregular warfare. What is different is the combination and the seriousness, the seriousness with which they apply irregular warfare. Everything is indirect. The focus is on the will, on the non-kinetic. They'll send in the little green men eventually, but we now know, unclassified open source, that prior to the uh, Crimean intervention, Russia had been undermining the Ukrainian nation state for a decade with subversion, with uh, other means of Russian television. Action. They were, pe- they were to preaching, this day. Yes, they were preaching propaganda. Millions of right. dollars worth of propaganda being right. pushed into the region, into the Baltic region as well, right now. So it, it, is, it is the comprehensiveness of their understanding of irregular warfare that is the danger. When you got to the National Defense University, <laughs> Uh, as the son of a man who fought the Soviets, did you perceive that they saw Russia and Russia's action? Russia's very good at this. It yeah. always has been. Did they see it? 
I have to admit, when I arrived, uh, there was st- you could take many courses on Thucydides. Right. You could take many courses on uh, Guadalcanal. And, and the, the, the most modern thing you could do, the most relevant thing you could do, is take courses on the Balkan Wars of the 1990s. So there, there was, it was an aspect. The, the, the syllabus of the JPME, the Joint Professional Military Education System, was kind of frozen in the 1990s. This is during the Bush administration yes. when you arrived. Yes. And the Obama administration did not improve on no. the model. One more detail because it's always in the news now. China is a foe. Is a the, foe. The foe. The meeting with Mike Pompeo yesterday was a demonstration of, of Chinese aggression by Wang Yi, the foreign minister, the Decatur incident last week, again and again and again. When you arrived in the Bush administration, when you lived in Washington teaching at the Marine Corps University, did they understand that China was a foe? Six people. Not, not as an institution. Not, not as the five-sided brain of the defense industrial complex. No. There were rare uh, moments of, of enlightenment and individuals who would interject now and again, but as a nation, no, because we had bought into the Kissingerian inheritance yes. that liberalization of economics will bring liberalization of politics. Right. If you give the gangster everything, the gangster he, will he, he reform. Will be, he will right. become nice. You quote from Chao Liang and Wang Shan Tzu, the two, two colonels, colonels, who write the same doctrine that Abu Bakr Naji <laughs> wrote. They write it in Mandarin. Right. They don't write it in Arabic. But it's the same, and it's public knowledge. It's out there since 1999, unrestricted warfare. It's 300, 400 pages, but you can read it in English. Now, with all official Chinese documents, caution. Uh, 20 to 30% is propaganda meant for the white man. But if you read between the lines, you will see... Sun Tzu has been so internalized, and they are the, – the, the concept is making trouble for the troublemakers. Right, right. And who are, who are the troublemakers? We are the troublemakers. Unrestricted warfare. That is not regional hegemony. hegemony. <laughs> no, no. That's unrestricted warfare. Challenge right. the United States and defeat the United States. And like the Russian doctrine, essentially, there is no peace. There is no dichotomy between war and peace. You are always at war. May not be kinetic, but you are always politically, propaganda, economically at war with the United States. The book is Why We Fight, Defeating America's Enemies with No Apology. Sebastian Gorka is the author. We have walked around politics, but when we come back, we will address politics directly because Seb is here and Seb and I are having this conversation because of the amazing facts of November 2016. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. So Sebastian Gorka, my colleague is the author of the new book, Why We Fight, Defeating America's Enemies with No Apologies. We've outlined the foes, the jihadists, the former Soviets, now just straight-up Russian aggressors, and the Chinese, the the People's Republic of China under Xi Jinping, the president for life. Extremely aggressive, not just in East Asia, uh, uh, East Asia, but throughout the globe. We turn now to how Seb came to having conversations on television and drawing upon his experience in the Trump administration. Again, it starts with a phone call, (laughs) just like 9-11 did. Seb, answering your phone is a dangerous moment (laughs) in your life. You are are in Washington. In Quantico. In Quantico, sorry. You're in Quantico at the moment, and your phone rings, and you pick it up, and someone named Corey Lewandowski wants to talk to you. Who was he, and what did he want? I didn't know who he was, but apparently he was the then uh, campaign uh, manager of candidate Trump, who said to me, uh, Mr. Trump is preparing for the big fall Republican debate on national security, and he's looking for some advice. Would I be willing to come and meet with him? Of course. So I fly to New York. I fly to Trump Tower. We meet just the three of us, Mr. Trump, at his office desk, as as close as we are to each other. Did you visit me that day? Did you come in to see me? Yes, I think so. And we recorded, and you said, I have a meeting uptown. Yes, yes, yes. yes, And and you had an overnight bag. Yes. And you were – all right, please continue. Right, so it's just me, the future president of the United States, and Corey uh, sitting in a corner. 
And I'd never met the man before, and we had this incredible blue sky discussion for about 40 minutes, ranging from everything, the Civil War, which he clearly has a passion for, right up to the Middle he East. A- he asked questions. Oh, yes. Yes, the whole lots time. of questions. My opinion. Right. He always wants – in the White House, it's the same. What do you think of? He's constantly wanting to hear different opinions. From the Civil War to ISIS to nuclear weapons, you name it, and then halfway through the conversation, classic Trumpism, he, he stops the discussion, turns to Corey and says – I like this guy. Let's hire him. This, this classic, you know, Queen's decisiveness. And so I sign my NDA and I start writing uh, policy pieces for the upcoming debate. And um, within moments, you're on television with him. <laughs> yes. Discussing yes, in Milwaukee, policy on a stage. On, on stage. Right. With, I think it was Fox that carried yes, it. Yes, it was, it was Sean moved his show to Milwaukee. Right. And we had uh, candidate Trump and myself on stage. I looked at that that night, and I thought, that's Sam. <laughs> Sam. Now, what the candidate wanted to know from you is what he still wants to know, how we defeat the enemy. That's the book you're writing. Without, without getting entangled. Right. I mean, this is massively important for the conservative voter, for the listener. Donald Trump will never be neocon. He will never go neocon on us. His reflex is all – I remember to this day – I was in the Oval, just the two of us, and for some reason I wasn't there for that discussion, but North Korea came up, and he just out of the blue looks at me and he says, I do not want to get embroiled in a war in that right. part of the world. I mean, he has this reflex. We don't do it. If it's stupid, if it's, not, if it's not vital, if it's not instantaneous, I'm not interested. So the same questions that he asked then are the ones he's asking today. Let's talk about how it is that you join the campaign, and you witness this transformation of America. And you have many thoughts about the politics, but I want to bring in a chapter of your book that seems important here. Uh, Ronald Reagan, you quote Ronald Reagan, um, his, his version of the Cold War. Uh, I wrote it down here. My theory of the Cold War is we win and they lose. Is that Donald Trump's opinion? <laughs> He's a winner, isn't yeah, he? Yeah. He's a winner. Yeah. He likes to win. All right. Uh, that opinion was backed up by the efforts of the Reagan administration to make the case why it is we're better than the Soviets. Right. That is something that's been missing for since the attack on New York. It it's has. actually been missing since the first attack on the World Trade Center. It has. It has. And, and that is why I, I, I say it in the book, I say it in, in Why We Fight, I truly believe whatever happens in the next six years, the president's President Trump's Warsaw speech will be one of the most historic speeches he gives as the 45th president because it's the language that we recall from the 1950s. It's full of the transcendental. It's full of the godly. But it's also about Judeo-Christian civilization. And in it, it has a a heart-stopping moment in the penultimate paragraph. It's not a happy, clappy speech. It is a serious, weighty speech. And he says, the only question before us today, and I'm paraphrasing, is whether we have the will to defend the values upon which our civilization is built. And the fact that he gave that speech where he did. We, we, the Polish government wanted to have him in some fancy location downtown. We said, no, the President of the United States will give this speech next to the statue of the Warsaw Uprising, where those brave uh, Poles came up from the sewers to fight the fascists that had occupied their country. And thankfully, the Polish government agreed, and that speech will be a historic speech. Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. It didn't win the war, but it capped it beautifully. Yeah. And it signaled to you, everyone who loved Eastern Europe, that there was a new day coming. Uh, Donald Trump, we turn now to ISIS, because when you were in the campaign, ISIS was understood by the Obama administration as an existential, existential threat that we have to live with. A generational threat. Right, right. It's flabbergasting to review the language at the time. I guess I can argue that they were so burned by their collapse in Libya, they didn't want to engage anything else. That but it predated that. It predated the collapse of Libya. If you think about the fact – so uh, just one uh, illustration. At near the end of the administration, there was a very – there was a speech the president gave or a press conference where there was a, 
overtones of petulance where he said, what deference is it what I call the threat? Do you remember that? Yes. So he was, yes, he was actually yes. addressing candidate Trump. What deference is it what I call the threat? Well, clearly in 2011, it made a big difference to the Obama administration because in 2011, before ISIS, before Libya, before the collapse of Syria, the White House decreed in a memo to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and to the then Attorney General that you must not use the word jihad and you must not mention Islam in all federal counterterrorism training of federal agents or the U.S. armed services. Well, which is it, John? Is it irrelevant what we call the threat or do we have to have Orwellian newspeak control in 2011 of what we are allowed or not allowed to say about those who call themselves jihadists. That was the schizophrenia of the Obama years. And candidate Trump and then transition President-elect Trump and then President Trump addressed directly to his military, we win, they lose. And unleashed them. I, 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 I don't know if I mentioned it in the book, but there was this moment two months into the administration where we had a group of soon-to-be Green Berets who just about to finish the Q course, the selection qualification course at Bragg, come and visit the NSC. And I took them in to see the president because he's, we have a new commander-in-chief. And one of the people accompanying them it was a JSOC operator, somebody from across the fence, as we say, the best of the best. And he, came, he knew who I was. I didn't recognize him. He was in civvies. And he came up to me, and this is just a few weeks into the administration. He said, Dr. Gorka, I have to tell you one thing. You have no idea how the morale of everybody in theater has skyrocketed since January the 20th because we are being allowed to do our job. That's important when you're storming uh, the beaches of Normandy or it's – important when you're going into a Taliban cave in Afghanistan and there's just 12 of you. And it's important right now for the forces that are in Syria yeah. holding the line against the Iranians, Iranians. That, they, that they have somebody in the White House who says, we win, they lose. And I have your back. Yes. Um, back to the politics of you and the campaign. Here you are making a case, we know now, your first book, and Defeating Jihad, and now the new book, Why We Fight. You're making a case that is surprisingly not embraced by the... The elite. <laughs> Shall we call it what they wish to call it? I, I puzzle sometimes, Seb. I just We sag, need a new word. You know, it's, it's like... It's common sense. Yes, I know, but I, what do we do with our education? If we're, you, see what, you see how confusing it is. The, edu- I, the books are there. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's nothing I've talked in- to you about Vietnam, lessons learned. We read the same... We all can read the same books. We go to the... It's flabbergasting. But we read books, John. We read books. We don't read 700-word opinion pieces, and we don't just read tweets. This is some, Somebody asked me in an event recently, what advice would you give people who are, want to be part of this career? And I said, easy. Turn your phone off and read. Mm-hmm. Now, the fact that I have to say that, and that actually it's quite a provocative statement – Tells you where we are, John. The, 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 the men and women who are being paid to interpret political campaigns in this country have access to the same information. <laughs> they have degrees from many of the same universities. But they and talk yet to each they other. won't embrace what you were helping the president to see that it needs to be conveyed to the American yeah. people again and again. Let, how, we win, it, they this lose. This is so important. But, but it's not just that. It's common sense in general. The pre- this maybe has not come across in the media, but the president is incensed daily by the fact that rich allied and partner nations have us pay for their defense. And he was – in the campaign, he was saying, "What? sorry, what is this Asian nation that is one of the most successful economies in the world? Why are we paying for their defense? Now, why is that a controversial question? It's only controversial if you live in the bubble of the Acela Corridor. Yes. We'll turn to uh, up-to-date politics in a moment. It's impossible to keep it out. You see, it keeps, keeps pushing in, Seb. So why we fight, defeating America's enemies with no apologies. We win, they lose. Ronald Reagan. It works. Sebastian Gorka is the author. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. Sebastian Gorka is with me, and we have 
been disciplined in talking about the contest and our foes. But we turn now to mm, anecdotes that come in Seb's book and that are constantly with us, because Seb and I talk a lot. We talk each week. And we set out to talk national security, and then we get (laughs) dragged into this other thing. And we've just come through the Kavanaugh embroglio. We're still bogged down in the Russiagate mysteries. Uh, We have a midterm election Always midterm. There's always an midterm election. That's the way we we run frequent elections. It was my opinion, Seb, that the opposition, that includes the media, would grow exhausted with their routine rejection of policies they don't understand. Do you measure there's any diminution in the in the resentment, in the rebuking of the success, the um, overwhelming success of the Trump agenda? On the contrary, when in the last two days, a talking head on one of these channels, with reference to the Kavanaugh decision, talks about this is Donald Trump cementing his control over America, perhaps for a thousand-year Reich. This is a paid commentator on a news channel. Uh, this is it's, – it's not funny anymore because what do you say to people of my parents' generation? My, my parents are past, but there are survivors sure. of Nazi uh, occupation, of the Holocaust, living in America as Americans. We sent 10, more than 10 million GIs to fight the fascists and the imperialists, and now this person wishes to call America the Third Reich – They have learned nothing, and it seems as if they are doubling down. And that's why, ironically, my last chapter on Whitaker Chambers is is timely beyond compare. Let's mention, because Seb profiles Stephen Decatur, and that was – he was born – in 1779, so that was the fight with the fr- shores of Tripoli yep. and Thomas Jefferson. You profile a hero, Chesty Puller, who was born at the turn of the century and tried to sneak past his mother to get into the Marine Corps. <laughs> at the age of 16. Yes, fine. Had to go to Virginia Military Techni- uh, right. Institute, yep. I believe, yep. and wound up uh, holding the line with a very few number of Marines on Guadalcanal. Correct. You also profile an American hero who shot down in Vietnam, savagely tortured. Six and a half years in the Hanoi Hilton. And right. uh, does not in any way doubt his service today. But in there is Whitaker Chambers. What doesn't belong and why? Whitaker <laughs> Chambers. Whitaker Chambers is a man who, who wrote very well. He worked for Time magazine. And he decided that he was going to come forward and say that Alger Hiss was a Soviet agent. And I know this because I was part of the chain. And he was pummeled, Seb. Yeah. He was Kavanaugh before Kavanaugh was born. Right. I mean, this is, this is the, the fascinating thing about those who are shocked about the treatment that this godly man, this boy scout of a federal judge, received over the last month. This is not new for people on the left in America. For, in the first televised congressional testimony of its kind, Whitaker Chambers, a former communist, likewise stood up for the truth with regards to Soviet penetration of the then administration and Al Hiss. For his sins of speaking the truth, he was accused of being a homosexual, of cheating on his wife, uh, of being responsible for his brother's death. Alcoholism. Alcoholism. Yes. All of it. None of it was true. They threw everything, everything they had everything. at the moment in the locker at him. Right? Why? Because Al Hiss was a darling of the Democrat intelligentsia. So um, what happened to Justice, now Justice Kavanaugh, is not new, John. It's 70 years old. And yet here we come to the moment in American politics where we do not have a vision of comedy. We don't no. have it. No. Um, you know that I talk all the time with our colleague Michael Lejos. Is this a civil war? A salient fact that I repeat all the always is that you can't know it's a civil war when you're in it. Yeah. 2,000 years, only afterwards that you know. So I'm not going to ask you that. We can't know, Seb. I, I, and, I, I, and yet the struggle here, you're saying very common sense. You said it. You say very commonsensical things. I don't think we're being deep. No. We're not talking about the, the Kennedy's we're decision po- to assassinate the Ziem brothers. We're not asking we're for a We're pointing out the emperor's lack of clothing. That's all we're doing. It's not deep metaphysical philosophical analysis. 
but for some reason it's controversial. This is, this is the problem. So the fact that, that the common sense is now provocative, I, I don't know about civil wars. I, I, I try to shun that question, but I do know the compact is broken. Yes. Whether the May, we can go back to the Mayflower. The compact upon which the nation was established prior to its independence no longer is respected by a large proportion of the elite. This is the problem. You have uh, recommendations of what to read and what you read in the book. And I and see radio shows s- to listen to. Yes, you're very kind. <laughs> Thank you. But we've been together so long, it doesn't touch me. All right. One book in particular, Victor Davis Hanson's The Second World Wars. Yes. And I talk to Victor all the time. You know that. Yes. And last week we talked about the, our frustration uh, about the defense industry and whether it's going to continue to be given the tools that it needs, and there's always the concern now if the Democrats control the House, there'll be a pullback in the, the commitment yeah. to rebuilding. Victor makes the point, your parents' generation made the point, that the best way to ensure peace is strength. It's an easy point, isn't it, Seth? It, it, it is. It's, I think it's the motto of my first chapter. If you wish to have peace, prepare for war. Uh, but prepare in a way that intimidates yes. the bad actors. Right. You've got and, this- and don't be readable. I mean, this is why Victor's analysis of the current commander-in-chief is so priceless. You want Beijing not to be sure. You want the mullahs not to be sure and about they're what, not. And, and they're Beijing not. Beijing is not. And which is good. Yes. They're afraid. Yes. The demonstration within hours of Wang Yi, the foreign minister of China. Not being happy. Ranting <laughs> yeah. at Mike Pompeo, who remains serene through it all, although he reminded him that this is not acceptable conduct. Seb, they threatened Taiwan. They threatened the U.S. Navy. To, uh, uh, our colleague Gordon Chang's analysis is that there's instability in, this, in the standing committee around Xi. Uh, it's because of strength. Look at the messages being sent with regards to our tariffs. They are blinking. They are blinking every day, John, and for good reason. And it's good for America and for our partners in the region who, when we came in to office, were very, very worried after the last eight years. They felt as if they had been deserted. Not anymore. Sebastian Gorka, Why We Fight, Defeating America's Enemies with No Apologies, the new book. You can see him on Hungarian television in 2001 (laughs) or American television in 2018. And always with me, I thank you very much, Seb. Congratulations. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show.